welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Campbell. I'm a doula in Washoe County, Nevada, a Medicaid provider, a lactation educator, childbirth educator, and mom of 18. You can find me and connect on doulainreno.com. Remember, give a shout out to those who are brave enough to share their stories with us on how they have become parents. Let's dive in. Welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. Today, I'm really excited. I have Spring Richardson's Perry on. How are you today, Spring? I am well, thank you. How are you, Jennifer? Good. You're the best name ever. It's like you're like the blossoming of all things that are beautiful. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I try to emulate that in real life. Uh, I love that. Jump in and tell us how you became a parent. Ah, we are jumping right in. So, yeah, becoming a parent for me. Um, I was 24 when I had my first, um, baby boy. And that was from my previous marriage. My first three kids were from my first marriage. Then my last one I have four is from, um, my current marriage. And so it, I don't know. It's just one of those things. I always knew that I wanted to be a parent. Um, and it just sort of happened. I think the first time kind of some people it's on purpose. Mine was not, but I was very excited. I was scared. I was nervous because it's like, what am I going to do with this little person when this person comes? And I'm still trying to figure my life out and another that I have to be responsible for. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of pretty much it. I was I was 24 and my ex-husband and I at the time we were dating, we weren't married yet. And um, so I was kind of scared for that too, because I was just like, okay, well, where's this relationship going now? Am I going to have support to raise this baby? What is going to happen? Um, so all these things kind of going through my head, trying to figure out what, um, you know, what is next? How is this going to look? What is going to happen? Um, but I had my oldest, he is now 12. His name is Eden. Um, and it, it was, it was great. I had a midwife, um, that delivered the baby, um, but we delivered in the hospital because they did not have a birthing center that they were using at the time. Um, and 12 years ago, um, delivering with a midwife was still kind of, it went, and I was in New Orleans. So at the time in New Orleans, it was still kind of this, this fresh idea. And it was a alternative. It was considered at the time, um, insurances were just coming around to pay for the midwives as, um, um, your practitioner, your primary practitioner for your pregnancy. And so, um, it was something that I always wanted because doctors have a very strict and rigid way of doing things. Um, and I'm all, I've always been, been very, very on top of my own health. Uh, very with my own body um not really don't really like um traditional like western medicine so i'm not much for medication not much for um just all the extra stuff because i firmly believe that our bodies were built to naturally handle these things and so that that was just the way that i was so but i still ended up um delivering in a hospital because like I said they didn't have a um they didn't have a a birthing center at the time but um it was a great experience <laughs> nonetheless I will never forget I was now that I look back on it having contractions throughout the night but I just thought oh I'm just uncomfortable and um it's just being pregnant mm. and um that morning I will never forget I was I was at my mom's house and I was in the bathroom and I just stood there and I'm just kind of like, like, I just had this look on my face and she looked at me and she said, hey, you're in labor. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I was like, this, like, I'm just, it's just, you know, pregnancy. Like it's just the end of the pregnancy. It's so Braxton hit like <laughs> in labor. I was like, no, no, no. I was like, don't worry. I'm fine. Like, don't just go to work. And if anything happens, I'll call you. Fair enough. I was in labor. <laughs> and so um, I got to the hospital. My, my ex-husband took me to the hospital. And um, 
I like literally got there like nine o'clock in the morning and I delivered four hours later. Oh my gosh. Uh, mm. so I delivered at at one twelve and um they were like it was hilarious. I'll never forget this. Because I didn't want any epidural. Nobody thought I was going to really do it. They were like, oh, this is your first. You're going to want epidural. You're going to want this. You're going to want that. And it's going to take a long time. So when I got there, they kind of put me in a room and kind of forgot about me. And so I got in the shower and I was just letting the hot water run on my back. And it was really, really helpful um, in sort of like relieving the pain of the, the contractions. And for me, it, was, it wasn't really bad, but I'm just, yeah. I have a high tolerance for pain. So I just needed something to just kind of ease the stress. So I was just in the shower, just letting the water run on me, the hot water. I was walking around, just kind of just trying to do whatever I could to sort of mitigate the pain. And I guess I let out this really loud scream. And and my mama and um, my ex-husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, he was, they were like, hey, y'all need to get in here and check her. So they got the nurses came in because literally they thought this is her first baby. It's going to take her a while. She's going to be okay. Like, because they were full. So they came in and checked me. The look on that nurse's face, she was like in full panic mode. And they were like, (laughs) they were like, who's your doctor? It's midwife. And they were like, she like literally ran out of the room. And they were like, when she came back in, she was all like, ready clothes suited up and I was like oh because she said yeah you're about nine and a half centimeters dilated I was like huh? I just got here like what are you talking about so- <laughs> I just got here I have to be here for at least 10 hours to make it worth it so right you know like I really <laughs> thought you were supposed to be in labor for like 10 to 12 hours so I was like there's no way and so um so when the midwife got there mm-hmm. um I probably pushed for maybe 30 minutes and uh, we had a baby, and she was looking at me like, "Girl, do they make them like you anymore?" Because this no. is like <laughs> the easiest birth I've ever had. She's like, you know, labor and stuff like pushing and all of that. It's like sometimes people are pushing for an hour, two hours. I was like, yeah. "What?" I was like, "There was no way I was gonna be laying on my back, mm-hmm. having pushing a baby out for an hour." Like, I think I gave her. <clears throat> I was afraid at first, so I pushed like maybe four or five times. And she was like, she was like, all right, look. I mean, she put the mirror down so I could see. She's like, look, you can see the head coming, but then it would go back up. Right. I wasn't pushing hard enough. She said, so give me like two or three good pushes and you'll have yourself a baby. I was like, let's do it. <laughs> and, and I did it. And out he came. And so that was that was my introduction to motherhood. That is a beautiful introduction. It was, um, you know, my oldest daughter's 31 and I had a midwife at a birthing center, but she transferred me. It's so interesting um, how many things have changed over the years and how many things haven't changed over the years, but good for you. I mean, we have midwives in the hospital here. I'm in Nevada and uh, we have nurse midwives in the hospital. They only do the night shift. It's just, we, it's just interesting how, it changes, but it really depends. It's great that you had the same caregiver throughout your pregnancy who was also there in your delivery. I think that's really rare these days. But um, yeah, they've made progress in some areas and not in other areas, but good, good job. So your first experience was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be a mom. This is exciting, but scary. And then you obviously had more kids. So the next two, were they planned better? And I, I know at some point you had trouble with pregnancy so and I don't want to miss the one in the middle um so jump in and and continue on with your baby story because that was a really that was like the best one ever that's how they should all be (laughs) it was easy so I kind of like psyched myself out because I'm like oh this is easy I can do this again and again and again clearly I did but the next one um I got pregnant two years later and um uh, had the midwives again, and we ended up like, I want to say I was about seven months pregnant, and moved from New Orleans to San Antonio, Texas. Mm-hmm. So I had to transfer my care, but I found midwives in San Antonio um, that were that were just as good as my midwives um, back in New Orleans, and it was a group of them, whereas the ones in New Orleans, it was two of them, 
Um, so I really enjoyed um, knowing that one of them would be able to attend the birth because that was kind of sort of the other sort of looming thing with the two midwives in New Orleans was that they were starting to, when I got pregnant the second time, they were kind of starting to like pull back because they had been in practice for like 20 or 30 years or so. So they were mm -hmm. starting to, um, I guess, start the, re the retirement process if you ever really retire. But, yeah. you know, but they were starting to sort of pull back. And um, so there was that, there was just that possibility that when I got to the hospital, neither one of them would be available to come in. And that was kind of scary for me because I'm like, I don't want anybody that I don't know to be in here with me. And Right. So. Yeah, that's a big deal. Um, I like deal. I like group practices for midwives because it, you usually it's not like there's 20 of them. You know, with OBs, there can be like 20 of them and uh, you don't know who you're going to get. But with mid, midwives, if it's like five or six even, you'll get a chance to meet and know every one of them. So I love that. OK, OK. But a move and all of that stuff, that's a big deal. It was a big deal. And that's exactly how the practice was set up. It was five of them. And so mm -hmm. I got to know each and every one of them, even within that short period of time. And um, so the pregnancy itself was was really, it wasn't bad at all. Like, and it was better than my first one because my first one, I was sick for like five mm -hmm. months straight, literally. I had, um, I'd actually, I was in school getting my master's when I was pregnant um, the first time. And I actually like withdrew from school because I, literally was so sick I could not keep up I would spend just days and days and days in the bed just throwing up throwing up throwing up all day I remember I thought something was wrong with me one day because I was throwing up so much that I just started throwing up yellow stuff like the bile in my stomach and I thought something was wrong with me I went to the hospital like no, 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 no. Like, it's okay <laughs> cheers to that <laughs> <laughs> like you're okay it's never but, too um, much <laughs> it's never too much obviously right I yeah. mean literally five months straight but um, when I got, when I had the second pregnancy, I wasn't as sick. And so I was like, thank God. And then I was still sick, but it wasn't nearly as intense as the first time around. So I was good. I was okay. I was like, oh, this is, you know, I can deal with this. This is great. And so that pregnancy was a lot smoother for me. However, I ended up having a placental abruption. And I remember mm -hmm. the exact moment that it happened. We were at um, we were out to eat at, um, a Chinese restaurant and we were eating. And I remember sitting in the, uh, booth cause we were sitting in a booth. It was me, my ex-husband and my oldest, he was two at the time. And we're sitting there and I was like, squirming like this. And, um, my ex-husband who was my husband at the time, we had gotten married since having the first baby. And, mm -hmm. um, he was looking at me and he was like, are you okay? He was like, are you in labor? Like, What's going on? I was like, I don't think I'm in labor. Like, this feels different than the labor pain from before. I was like, I don't know. I was like, it's something though. I said, let me call the midwife. I called the midwife. I explained to her what what I was feeling. She said, yeah, it doesn't really sound like you're in labor. She's like, but you can come up here to the hospital. She's like, I'm here. Um, if you want to come up, she said, but she said, we probably won't be able to like, give you a room or see you. She said, because we are fully booked right now. She was like, and you know, if you come up, you're probably just going to be sitting waiting. So she was like, she said, go home. She said, if you want to go home, you can sit in a hot bath and then call me in a couple of hours and just tell me how you're feeling. So I went home. That's what I did. I was like, yeah, I don't want to go to the hospital and just be sitting there if they're not going to be able to do anything. So I went home, sat in hot water, which always works for me. Yep. Um, you know, like before when I was in the shower. And so, um, it, it the pain subsided. So I was like, oh, okay, that's good. It 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 worked. It did what it was supposed to do. So I called her. I said, yeah, I'm feeling better. I'm gonna just go lay down. And um, I had an appointment that that was Wednesday night. Um, I had an appointment set up for that Friday. So Thursday when I woke up, something felt really really different. And I literally remember thinking, something's not right with this baby because I, like I honestly felt the baby just floating around in my stomach like and not really any movement itself and it's not right I was like I have an appointment tomorrow like we'll see what's going on but I got there on Friday 
and they were looking for the heartbeat. And they kept looking, kept looking, they brought the Doppler in, then they got the like ultrasound machine to could not find it. And initially it didn't scare me because, you know, there's it takes some time, it takes a little bit to find a heartbeat because they were moving around a lot. But it was like something was just not in me because I was like something wasn't right to begin with. I knew that. And yeah. um they couldn't find a heartbeat and they did the ultrasound and they saw what had happened and I was devastated at that moment because I was like what like how did this happen I was like like everything was fine and then all of a sudden I was like I was wrong I was like, Please, like what happened and so they ran tests and everything and it wasn't it wasn't anything they were like we don't see anything mm-hmm that you've done wrong and they were like we are so sorry that you know this isn't the answer that you wanted because at least if I know it was something that I did I could fix that right but there was nothing that I could fix because they didn't <clears throat> find anything and they were just like you know sometimes these things happen and for me you know it kind of worked against me in this in this instance because I do have a high tolerance for pain so the pain itself they're like, yeah, people who normally experience a placental eruption are in excruciating pain. I was like, well, I mean, is it any worse than labor? Like, you know, it just, it wasn't, it yeah. just wasn't bad to me. I was like, yeah, it was a bit uncomfortable, I think, but it wasn't like excruciating. And so, you know, I really didn't know that anything, anything bad was happening. And so I just, it was a really, really tough time because I was, 37 weeks when it happened. Wow. And so I was I'm full term. So I was sorry. Like almost ready to deliver. So um, so I had to be induced. And that was the only time that I had an epidural. Yep. Um, because I was like, you know what? I don't want to feel anything. I don't want to remember anything. I don't want to know anything. Just let's just get this open. Um, and so, but then when I had the epidural, that was like the worst experience ever. I had this metal taste in my mouth and I was yeah. throwing up and like that's why I didn't do it in the first place so so that happened and I was just you know I I, I was devastated and I, I didn't have another baby for another three years which yeah. is when my daughter was born because I just I was afraid I didn't know what would happen if that would happen again how you know how, like how it would feel if I would have to be on bed rest or what and so I just I just I waited. I took the time that I needed to kind of just get over that experience and not really get over it because you're never really over it, right? Right. But I love that you said it that way, that you waited to work through that. The interesting thing about miscarriage, stillborn, like a fatal diagnosis, any of those situations where babies, you know, born not alive or passes almost immediately is that it's not treated as a normal pregnancy. I had a woman who same, same situation as you at 38 weeks, her boss asked if she, since the baby didn't live, if she could come back to work earlier. And I was just like, you've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding me. Like your body goes through the exact same thing, exact same thing might've been harder on your body actually. And you know, you give birth to a full term baby that's never going to take a breath. And people are kind of like, I'm so sorry, walk it off, jump back into life, you know, and yeah, spring, I'm so sorry. It's, it's hard to just jump back in because then as a, as a woman, you feel like, okay, I've just done all of this over the last nine months and I have nothing to show for me. Like what is wrong with me? Right. What is wrong with with my female? Right, because you're a woman, so we're going to immediately blame ourselves for everything. Although medically, you want to know. I think there's two parts to that with when this happens. One is, is there something that could have been done differently? Is there something inadequate with my reproductive system? Is it me? Like, can I do anything? Because we want to be productive. We want to fix it for the next time. Um, And also, I think women just kind of take the blame like like it was our fault Mm. yeah and that's kind of where that's kind of where I was in that in the in that space in one moment feeling like okay they said it wasn't my fault but 
really was it not my fault? Because like, is there yeah. something I could have done? And then it's like really wanting to know medically, what does this mean? How do I fix it moving forward? Yeah. What's going to happen to me? Am I able to have more kids? Like, what does that even look like? And so, you know, I was just, it was a, for a while, it was kind of a dark period for me because I was just like, you lost a child. Yes. Yeah. And so I just really didn't know how to feel. But I, I do, I will never forget, there was um, uh, another girl in there who that had happened to, but she was 20 weeks, I think somewhere between 20 and 24 weeks. Um, and she lost her baby in there as well. And I remember thinking, uh, because the nurse, she came in and she's like, you know, I'm so sorry. I hope I didn't overstep my boundaries. She was like, but, you know, there was someone else experiencing the same thing. And I really thought that if you guys connected, that that may be a, a level of support for you. And I was so thankful to her for that oh. because I felt like in that moment, there was, it wasn't me, you know, that this is something that happens. And even though, the medical professionals they tell you you know these things happen you kind of feel like oh they're just supposed to say that to make you feel better but within real life yeah when you see it and it it, it happened at the same time as me another person was in there experiencing the same thing like that gave me a sense of okay you know perhaps when it wasn't you and that and and truly she and I kept in touch for quite a while after that mm. and um, it truly made me feel like, okay, friend, you can do this again because maybe it was something that kind of just happened, um, and it wasn't you. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know, something that you did, or it may not necessarily be um, your body. Perhaps it just wasn't your time. Perhaps there was something wrong, and God saw a bigger picture here, and. Yeah, I, I firmly believe everything happens for a reason. And so it wasn't, that wasn't something I wanted to think about, you know, why would you take a baby away from me? But at the same time, you know, there's, there's always this larger divine purpose, you know, so. So you had two, well, you've had three more since then. Um, Take us through that. And I, I want to, before we go too deep into that I also want to point out that you are an entrepreneur, you have your own business. And at some point in there, and I love the name of your business and the play on words. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> so I don't know how to weave this in, but with the next, and I know there was a divorce and you remarried and that I'm right there with you, sister. I mean, like I'm right there with you. So, uh, um, lots of us are in that situation. So I want to make sure that we, Touch upon the next three births and how they were different and your business as well. So the next three were, were really different because the one directly after I had a loss of baby, um, they were just on high alert. They were like, okay, and we just watched it closely. Um, it was considered mm -hmm. a high risk pregnancy. Um, I was still able to use the midwives because um, they had... Um, they were overseen by doctors themselves, so if there was yep. any issues, the doctors would come in. Um, so I was thankful that I was still able to utilize them, and they induced me at 37 weeks. So um, okay. that was pretty much that was pretty much the narrative for the the, the next two was like being induced at 37 weeks. And so, um, so I, I um, with the with my daughter who is now seven. Um, she, I, like my pregnancy was good. I wasn't sick as much. I, I was still like throwing up, but not as much as before. Um, and I was working and so I was good. And, and the actual, um, birth itself wasn't bad at all. And I was able to. Oh, good. Yeah. Even and with I the epidural. So you managed all that really well. I managed it very well. So she, when she came, I did not get an epidural. I told them I didn't want it. Okay. And then I then I will never forget. I was about nine centimeters dilated and I was like, this Pitocin is killing me. Yeah. I was like, we need to do something. So they were like, Yeah, well, I don't think if we give you this epidural that it's gonna make much of a difference. Um, because you're about ready to push. And so they gave me the epidural. It did not kick in until after I delivered her. And so <laughs> 
so yeah. I so like literally after they gave me the epidural, I like had maybe two or three pushes and came flying out. Um, healthy, beautiful baby girl. And then I had to sit there for about an hour or so, um, so I could feel my legs again. <laughs> the epidural didn't kick in until afterwards. And then with um my youngest son, he is six now, and um with him. I actually had um, an actual OB um, okay. deliver him. So that experience was a little different. He, But he came out with a cord wrapped around his neck. Um, and so he came out, he was like blue. And um, my, my husband, when he saw that, he just kind of like, he felt like, oh my gosh, are we going through this again? Like, this is just another stillborn baby. And so... He's like nervous. And so I didn't really know what's going on because I kind of like passed out a little bit. A little bit. Either you do or you don't. I did. And so after I delivered him, I kind of just I like kind of blanked out. And um I remember a lot of um doctors and nurses rushing in and they um, you know, the doctor was like telling me there's gonna be a lot of people coming in. It's okay, you know, we just need to make sure everything's all right. And I just kind of was like, okay, like, I was totally out of it. Mm -hmm. um but but he's fine he he was fine at the time they um resuscitated him and um he had to stay in the NICU I think for a couple of days so he was okay he went home when I went home uh, um yeah <laughs> good okay <laughs> he was good and he is a vibrant uh very talkative asked all the questions little boy a boy's boy and so um he's good <laughs> and then mom fourth baby now um is from my second marriage my husband and I my current husband and we have a baby girl and um she we had a midwife uh, we were gonna do we were planning for a home birth but um with with her I was I'm 36 now I started the pregnancy I was 35 and then no no 36 so I've always been 36 some of them you start at one age and yeah the year older <laughs> but, so advanced maternal age starts at 35 which is ridiculous but there we are yeah no i was 35 because okay. she was born in april and i turned 36 in june so i was 35 and that's what it was like advanced maternal age but i was throughout the pregnancy i was okay but then towards the end i started to have more fluid and um there were some things that they were just kind of concerned about she started like having this irregular heartbeat that they were like kind of concerned about um and so I ended up having to deliver in the hospital which is disappointing because I wanted to do it at home and so uh for the, the last time around the time so I ain't doing this again. but <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my next questions <laughs> but she is very healthy she is six months she'll be seven months on tomorrow actually on the 25th um and um you know I was she's a uh, very loud you probably can hear her in the background uh, I haven't I I'm surprised you haven't heard her? no I was like where I, we're gonna have kids show up on this podcast but no I haven't heard her at all she is very healthy super vibrant um and uh all of them you know all of them are very very healthy and I'm, I'm super proud of them but in, if you asked me about the business and the business yep. is called Time to Spring Forward and it is directly related to parenthood because during the pandemic, I needed more flexibility. And I've always kind of been um, a person who just loves autonomy and like flexibility, who needs that to really be able to be my most creative self. And um, during the pandemic, there were so many times that the kids were like quarantined and needed to be out of school. And I was having to like take off and do other things, like try to figure out my schedule to make sure that, um, you know, if they needed to be home, that I had to be home with them. Yeah. And so it just kind of got ridiculous. And I was like, you know what? Let's, let's, let's try this. Let's just, let's, let's see what happens. And uh, let's just try it. And I did. And so what I did was um, I was in I was in education at the time. I was teaching um, and 
I was um, working at a school in New Orleans. I was an assistant principal. And um, I had a little bit of flexibility at the school that I was at, but it was still very demanding. And so my time just, it has just gotten to be just a bit ridiculous in terms of even when I'm not in the building, there was a lot of things that I still had to do. So my family time was cut short with the kids. And so I just, I was tired of that. I wanted my time with my kids to be important because I'm like, you know, I'm at school all day with other people's kids and I make sure that I prioritize them mm-hmm. throughout the day. And I was like, and I felt like I wasn't able to prioritize my own kids. And so that's what sort of led me to um, just kind of mm-hmm. step out on my own. I had been doing some contracting work prior to going full, fully into entrepreneurship. Um, I was doing some professional development work, some content creation. Um, this was all within um, all within the, the lens of education. So doing some, some stuff like on the side, some contract work. Um, and then I stepped fully into it um, in September. Like I had formed the business that April of 2021. Okay. And um, some things happened at the school that I was working with. And I was like, you know what? Let's just see what happens. And it worked out. And I haven't looked back since. And so, um, what, so what, what I do with Time to Spring Forward is, is I work with organizations. Um, mainly, I love, I love working with a lot of nonprofits. And I've worked with a lot of schools. And we... Um, work on organizational effectiveness. So with schools, a lot of times that looks like professional development for their teachers, leadership development for that for their administrators, um, and then sometimes there's district level work that has to happen um, to make sure that um, their policies are uh, conducive to teachers, administrators being able to be productive at work. Um, and then with like nonprofits and and those sorts of things. I help them to find funding, grants. Um, I help them, actually there's a a, a lot of people who are mission driven and want to start a nonprofit. So we talk about what that looks like, if it makes sense. Um, And then I like, if if it does, I help them fully form their nonprofit organization from getting their 501c3 status all the way to Mm -hmm. finding funding to on their mission so Mm -hmm. so that is what time to spring forward is it was all created so that I could have more time with my kids be more autonomous with with my time and just be able to really give them the time and attention that they deserve from their mom I just love that I think you know there were so many things about the pandemic that were hard for sure but it it also exploded the birth of new things and that part is so exciting. So now you're done having kids. I am done. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> no more for you. Um, I, I just, I love the story. I love the story. I'm so grateful that you're willing to share, especially about the stillbirth. Thank you for being brave and strong and sharing that. That's really tough stuff. Um, and just how you maneuvered through the medical system in a way that worked for you and your pregnancy. It's a huge challenge for women to be able to do that, to really navigate that system where you may want a home birth, but if that's not an option medically or for your insurance or for insert reason here, that you can still navigate the medical system in a way that really works for you. And that is a beautiful thing to share. So I really appreciate you. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting that you say navigate it in a way that works for you. I just heard her. You heard her? I heard her. (laughs) (laughs) She's not happy. It's probably time for her to eat. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Time to go. Time to go. But um, the fact that you said navigate it in a way that works for you, a lot of times I think women are intimidated because you want to trust the medical professionals, but sometimes they impose things on you, treatment, treatment. different things and you may not necessarily have a full picture of you and yeah. at no fault of the the doctor themselves or no fault of you because you know you're not a doctor so you don't know right but the doctors do what they think is best for you and they may present you with maybe one or two options when there's perhaps four and you just you know you you chose from the lesser of two evils because I've kind of sort of had this happen and me personally like 
I'll go do my research. I'm going to say, okay, you know, let me think about this. Let me take a step back. And then I'll go and I'll look up all different sorts of things because I'm really into holistic um, practices. So I'm going to find a holistic way to um, get the job done. Like, for instance, with my oldest, I was constipated. And clearly that's a byproduct. He wants to talk about that. But it happened. Right. And I felt like it was never going to end up with the worst thing. And I found this key that helped with that. And so, like, yep, why would we talk about this? People, it happened. So, sorry to. <laughs> no, no, I love all things gross pregnancy here. That's all good. Yeah, but we don't talk about it, which is part of the problem. And there are ways to fix it. You shouldn't have to fight to be your own advocate over and over and over and over again. But you've done that. Right. So um, I just firmly believe that you can, that there are other ways to uh, take charge of your health. You don't have to um, give in to what the doctors say. And they are medical professionals. I do understand that. But if you don't feel comfortable with something that um, they're telling you, go with your gut and research, ask questions, see if there's alternatives to what they're suggesting. Um, and then bring it up, talk to them about it. Say, well, what if we did this instead? How would that, you know, how would that mm -hmm. impact the outcome? What is that going to look like? Because um, if you don't advocate for yourself, then nobody else will because they don't know that they need to. So. Yeah. Thank you so much, Spring. I appreciate you so much. I am so excited. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. <laughs>